Naše další přednáška je na téma Koňák a jeho role v mixologii. A náš dnešní přednášející přijal z Francie, před chvilkou jsem se dozvěděl, že přijal ve 12 hodin, takže z letiště rovnou sem, rychlej oběd v KFC na Evropský. Závidím. Dámy a pánové, prosím, přivítejme Fabián Lv. Okay, a little uh, problem with the picture. I don't know if we can fix that. Um, the first word you're about to see up there is actually in French, savoir-faire. Savoir-faire, know-how, is something we're going to be talking a little bit about today with the influence of cognac and mixology. And savoir-faire is pretty much, you know, adding your special talent, your special, you know, know-how in general, your... Yeah, very much your talent to the word. Your savoir-faire is mixology. Well, it means, you know, taking some different ingredients and bringing them all together so that you can create something with a superior aromatic richness, a different aromatic richness, superior complexity, good finish. Well, this is your talent, your savoir-faire. But guess what? It's also ours. We're kind of cousins, somehow. We are blenders. You're blenders. We're not really mixologists because we only play with different eau de vies. We're playing with different eau de vies that we brought to their you know, specific limit, to their maximum potential. And then eventually, we blended those eau de vies. We mixed them together. We were kind of mixologists in our own way to be able to create cognacs. Cognacs with, again, superior aromatic richness, Superior complexity, powerful finish, all that all together. And those will be beautiful bases for you to start working with. So we work the bases that which you're going to be playing with. It's really important. And that's our savoir-faire, also your savoir-faire. We are both in the blending, mixing you know, type of business. So we're going to be going with a little bit of savoir-faire there. Oh, I wish we could actually fix that thing because it's easier when it's uh, written better. We, as a cognac company, I'm going to be talking briefly about Hennessy. Hennessy, you know, we have three, what we call the pillars, three talents, which are the selection, the maturation, and the blending aspect over there. And we've had that, those three talents, for the last, yes, well, 
uh, yeah, it looks, it's, it's written here. I can, I can read it perfectly, actually. But um, we've, had the, we've been taking care, taking care of selection, maturation, and blending for the last 250 years. And it, that little video that you saw earlier, you know, coming in, you saw grapes, you saw a little bit of distillation process, a little bit of blending, a little bit of maturation, all that all together. And this is really what Hennessy is really talented with. So as soon as this uh, little, uh, should I try it again? All right. I mean, you should stop the clock there. Hold on just one second. Let's load something. Up and go. And go, and go. Yes, much better. There it is. So the three pillars, the selection, the maturation, and the blending, those have been true for Hennessy for the 250 years. I'm going to speed up a little bit from now on. Um, what do we mean when we mean all that? We know that Hennessy is the top international spirit brand made from wine. And again, wine is very good to us. This is something we're really, really proud of. We're proud of being a wine asset. What does that mean? Roughly, it means that we preserve, we like to preserve the natural flavors that come from the wine, from the grape originally and from the wine. We are not a type of you know, product that outsources different types of raw material. We, don't, we, we get everything from our soil, from our terroir, and we're really proud of that terroir notion altogether. And how can we actually turn those grapes into great wines, into grape, you know, uh, great top international spirit brand? Uh, because we have a tasting committee. And the tasting committee has a unique savoir-faire, again, passed down from generation to generation for the last 250 years. And this is very, very important to us. Allows us to make the things go from the beginning to what it is now with a quality matter. And uh, the tasting committee also took care of selection. And the selection is put in inventory. Allows us to have the largest and the most diverse, you know, reserve of different eau de vies in the world so far. And that's something very, very dear to us. But this is not only what we're talking about, talking about. We're talking about everything from grape growing to winemaking, distilling, maturation, and blending. We have an expertise in every step of the elaboration process. And to us, that, that mean, I mean, that's the, those are the elements that make us the top international spirit brand made from wine. So pretty much, how do you make cognac? Actually, you don't make cognac. You create cognac. We create Hennessy Cognac. So, allez, tac, tac. We start in the vineyards, quickly. Putain. Allez. I don't think it does want to. All right. There it is. As you've seen on the movie at first, Cognac is right there. It is a tiny little area in France. It's about 75,000 hectares. All the cognacs that you drink in the world come from that area. We're talking about an appellation d'origine contrôlée in French. Sorry for the translation. Appellation d'origine contrôlée is appellation d'origine contrôlée. Hey, well. um, we are in this area and nowhere else. And we have specific type of soil there, specific type of climate, specific type of subsoil altogether that make it very unique. The climate has, of course, influence from the Atlantic Ocean. So forget about trying to make cognac in China. There's no influence from the Atlantic Ocean there. Sorry, they cannot duplicate, you know, cognac, for example, we're talking about soil, subsoil, climate, and the influence of the human being too. That's part of the, of the terroir appellation. And on this area, vine has been cultivated there for centuries again on a very white type of soil and subsoil. We have about 70 meters of chalk there. That's where the grapes actually grow. And uh, it makes a very unique atmosphere in general for the grapes to grow. And, uh, we have on this general area different districts too. Grande Champagne, Petite Champagne around it, the Borderie, the Fin Bois, the Bon Bois, and the Bois Ordinaire. 
No need to remember all of them. For Hennessy, we just use the four first growth area, four first crews, the Grand Champagne, Petit Champagne, Borderie, and Fambois. Uh, on this region, we're going to be growing grapes again. So this is basically Cognac 101. You know, I mean, uh, Uni Blanc is a type of grape we use. Why do we use that? Well, because it is very acidic. It is very low in alcohol. It is pretty resistant to mildew, oidium, and other types of different, you know, fungi that can grow in the area. And it, it gives a lot of juice. And as you saw, we need a lot of, well, as you will see, actually, you will, we need a lot of juice. And this is exactly everything we need to make cognac. High acidity level, low, low sugar content, content, therefore low alcohol level at the end. The winemaking is natural process. The wine must be pure and natural. That means something. The selection is taken care of through the partnership with wine growers. We work with 1,700 partners all together to make sure that we get the right juice, the right eau de vie, the right distillates all together. And this makes sure that eventually we get large amounts of different stuff which we'll be able to blend. Again, the blending, mixing thing, you know, we're still uh, you know, in the cousin uh, area there. Um, after the, roughly the vineyards and winemaking, we're going to be taking the, 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 um, the, the, the wine and putting it directly into a pot still. This is one of our pot stills one of our, in one of our three distilleries that we have there. This is a distillerie du peu, one of our pot stills. And a pot still is composed of you know, those different elements. A boiler over there where we put the wine. Then the wine will go up in vapors in the still head through the swan's neck the still head will go through the wine, the swan's neck will go through the wine warmer and eventually will form a big coil, a big serpentine in the condenser. And there, that's where the, 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 the alcoholic vapors will be brought down to a liquid form. So it's going to be pretty much going like this. There's no sound, so you will be able to see the pot still as I just explained it. The first distillation process, because we're a double distillation process spirit, alcoholic vapors will go up. They will go through the swan neck. The swan neck will be a pipe that will go through the wine heater, or actually, yeah, go through the wine heater. Eventually, the vapors will be turned into a liquid form because the condenser holds uh, cold water. First part called the heads, then the second part called the brouillis, the last part called the tails. The brouillis are the important part. They will be redistilled the center part only. They will be redistilled the second time. And the same distillation process happens. We can bypass the wine heater, but in the condenser, the same thing will happen again. Liquid, I mean vapor, all the way down to liquid. The first part that comes out will be the heads. And after the heads come the heart, which is the eau de vie. This is what we're really interested in. After the heart, called the seconds eventually, and then the tails. Only the heart is an important, pro uh, uh, an important uh, process. It's really, really uh, important to us. And the heart is the raw distillate, the 70% alcohol type of liquid. And this is everything we're going to be needing and wanting. Over at Hennessy, for like most major spirit, uh, cognac producers, we like to use, we like to concentrate the flavors of the wine, as I said earlier. So we're talking about nine liters of wine that will end up in one liter of eau de vie. And this is why, well, first, cognac is expensive. Try to buy nine bottles of wine, and you'll see how much it costs. Try to buy one bottle of cognac, you'll see how much it costs. Make your own math there. And this is, and uh, we don't, we're not even taking into consideration the evaporation level which is roughly two to three percent per year. So this is, this is uh, it getting, it's getting a little bit more uh, pricey as well. But more than price, quality is everything we're looking for. Concentration of aromas there. We do partnership with 22 other distilleries just to be able to get as many varieties, as many flavors as possible so that we can get all the different, you know, uh, bases for our blends eventually as many eau de vie as possible to be able to get as many uh, flavored cognac as possible. The selection is the first pillar of Hennessy. 
we do have those eight members up there of the tasting committee. And those guys are really, really talented. They're the ones that are responsible to get all the different ingredients that will come into our cocktails, all the different eau de vies that will come into our cognacs. And those are really, really, really skilled, trust me. Um, again, daily, lots of uh, eau de vies are tasted between 60 and 120 per day are tasted there and uh, to be able to assess their potential, their quality and how far they will go in the final blend. And then we'll take care of maturation after the selection of so, um, you know, 1,700, the 1,700 suppliers that we get. We'll talk about maturation. Maturation is not aging. Aging is you take an eau de vie, you put it into a barrel, and you let it sit for as long as possible. This is aging. Anybody could do it. Maturation is a different notion. It's you take a specific eau de vie with a specific flavor profile, you put it into the appropriate type of barrel, and then you put it, you put it in for an appropriate amount of time. Because some eau de vies will be light and delicate and elegant. Do you want to put them in brand new oak barrels so that the oak can overpower and kill this eau de vie? No. You might want to put this eau de vie into an old barrel so that the influence of the oak will, is not too strong. Same thing, you have a young, lively, fruity eau de vie. Do you want to put it into, into an old barrel that doesn't, doesn't give much? Or do you want to balance the strong, natural flavors with a little bit of strength from the oak? That's what you might want to do. So it's taking a specific eau de vie and putting it into the appropriate type of barrel. And then some eau de vies will need two years to mature. Maybe some will need four, maybe six, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100. It, doesn't, it, it, it depends. Each and every eau de vie will be different. And maturation is really nothing, is, is something to be taken seriously. You take a specific eau de vie, in the appropriate type of barrel for the appropriate amount of time, depending on its potential. And this is what maturation is about. Again, handmade French oak cask is everything that we use to take care of maturation. Yes, slow and natural aging in barrels, depending on the potential of the eau de vie. Young or, or, or uh, I mean, uh, long or short, um, we don't like to you, you, you use, uh, use the term aging. Long or, or uh, uh, slow or short maturation is actually uh, whatever we like to use. Of course, as I said, you know, the optimum maturity, you know, it happens in the cellars. You actually see a couple of pictures of uh, some of our cellars. Again, the largest and the most diverse types of eau de vies that we have there. Quality control is important. We're not talking about any, again, the maturation aspect. It needs to be controlled. How is the eau de vie evoluting? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? Do we need to stop evolution or not? That's important. So every batch is tasted every year by the tasting committee. It's a tough job. Somebody has to do it, I guess. So they're, they're, it's part of their tasting between 60 and 120 different eau de vies per year, which is, again, it's, uh, trust me, quite a lot. And then eventually, we're getting closer to you guys, blending is the third pillar of Hennessy Savoir Faire. After selection, after maturation, blending is really, really the key. Because it's like a painter. I'm not gonna use analogies with mixologists. I know you will uh, throw things at me, but it's like a painter. We do have in inventory 350,000 barrels. If you give a painter black and white, he will be able to paint you beautiful shades of gray. Nothing but gray, but beautiful shades of gray. If you give him 350,000 different colors, he will be able to paint you beautiful things, and he will, be, he will be able to reproduce those beautiful things over and over and over and over again. Those 350,000 barrels, those 3,500 batches of eau de vies that we have, make sure that we have quality, in each and every bottle and make sure also that we have consistency in the quality of every bottle that we, that we, uh, that we, that we release. Yes, blending is combining the character of each eau de vie with other to craft a cognac that surpasses 
surpasses and enhances its individual elements. That means that one plus one equals three. It's that simple. That's pretty much what you're trying to do in your everyday job when you're creating great cocktails and all that. That's everything we do when we're creating oak cognacs. We're putting all together a beautiful eau de vie so that the sum of the separate elements can be superior to the individual elements put all together. And this is very, very important. And I really understand, I really think that you do carry, uh, you do, 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 do um, understand uh, all that. Um, you've been poured, you know, a little bit of Hennessy VS, which was, I think, your first glass that you had in your in your hand over there. If I put it on the right screen. Thank you. Okay. Hennessy VS is a reference. It's 2.7 million cases in the US only, 3 million cases all over the world. There are over 36 million bottles a year. This is what people, when you tell them, when you tell anybody in the world, do you know what cognac tastes like? Ding! They think about Hennessy VS, roughly. Every time you have Five bottles of cognac sold in the world. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Every time you have five bottles of cognac sold in the world, one of them will be Hennessy VS. Watch out for the picture. Yeah, I need to get the logo right. Yeah. Uh, this is a reference. This is very, very known. This is a good cognac taste. This is a strong cognac taste because it's been aged, is, uh, as you can see it, in or I said age, it's been matured in new oak barrels. So when you take a sniff out of this thing, you get a lot of that strong oak. It's normal, it's great, it's got, it's made of a, it's composed of a eau de vies, you know, that are majority from the Fambois area, nice and strong and fruity and, uh, and, and big and, and thick and all that all together. And we need some strong oak to counterbalance that. Unlike the second one that you have, which is Fino Cognac, we'll talk about it a little bit later. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. When you st when you start drinking the microphone, that means you get too much usually. So, uh, but uh, you get those strong flavors, candied orange and all that. This is a beautiful basis to start elaborating something, and we'll see what we can elaborate with that. Usually, when we taste, we swallow cognac. You don't, except if you're tasting fifty or sixty of them, uh, it gets a little tiring, but. When you taste, you swallow a few drops because you'll need to, be ex to experience the bitterness level. Bitterness, as you know, is located at the back of your tongue. If you do not swallow one drop, you don't experience the actual bitterness of the tannins because those, this product spent a few years definitely in, uh, in under oak. So you need to experience a few. A good indication that you're tasting right. You should still be able to taste, to talk while tasting. Too much. <laughs> Well, yeah, too much. But um, while well, you get that slight vanilla from the vanilla end of the barrel, you get that um, sweetness coming from the degradation of hemicellulose, which is a component of the wood, which is nice and normal. So you get that sharpness, which a little bit of a, you know, something vertical almost, like a, like a spicy fruit type of thing, you know, with a little bit of alcohol to it. Alcohol will be good there. As a co in a cocktail base, it will be able to bring all the different, different flavors that you will add, you know, in different components. So this is a very, very important, this is actually a great product to mix. On the nose, intense and fruity with pleasant oaky notes, I'll let your own nose make the different uh, components. Yes, yeah, thank you. Um, and then on the blah, 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 you know, it says, uh, you know, grilled almonds, lovely notes, reminiscent of fresh grape. Yes, it does, all that. Make your own judgment. You guys are professionals. Make your own judgment. Uh, however, it is true that it's rather an oaky and fruity type of eau de vie rather than uh, floral or spicy. A touch, of, a touch of spice, a touch of black pepper eventually. Finish is quite long, twists quite well. It's a beautiful little finish. Yes, yes, yes. It's pretty demanding in its creation. The reason why it is demanding is because we sell every year about 36 million bottles of it. So we need to have quality and consistency that quality. That's why it's actually pretty demanding. And it's difficult to make such a high quality VS Cognac in such a long run with a large range.
uh, in the I mean, uh, for a long period of time. Neat, on ice, long drink, mixed. Definitely, to me, it's a mixer. It's, re it's much better mixed than neat, on ice. Long drink is okay. Hennessy and ginger ale, Hennessy and, uh, and tonic, beautiful. Hennessy VS and tonic, beautiful. But as a long drink, is, uh, as a, you know, is a mixer, it's actually beautiful. Blah, blah, yeah, okay, well. Fino Cognac is the other um, cognac that you have in your glasses. As you see, this is the bottle up there. Uh, as you can tell, the color is uh, definitely different. The smell is very different. The flavors are very different. Um, we're not talking about the same type of heaviness. Hennessy VS is somehow, somehow a little thick, a little heavy, all that all together. We believe that Hennessy Fin de Cognac is a lighter product, different approach, something a, lo a lot more, I mean, lots of, lot more finesse, lots more elegance. And therefore, we don't want to kill that elegance by blending, by putting the cognac into a brand new barrel. So we used old barrels, aged barrels that don't reveal tannins that much, that don't bring so much sweetness to it altogether. And of course, the tannins being a little harsh and, and, uh, and bitter, we don't want to use too many of them. So it's meant to be, you know, a lot more delicate, a lot more subtle type of blend of eau de vis. And this is what we got. Subtle maturation, yes. So we're not so much into the fruity and the oaky. We're in the fruity, but lighter fruit, like pear and apples and things like that. And a lot more floral, honeysuckle, jasmine, things like that. Fresh mango, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, make your own palate. Taste it. It definitely has that mango on the palate, that light fruit, that would go well in a mixer as well. We're talking about... Uh, well, no, this is unusual. Yeah. This is, can be enjoyed on ice as a long drink. Of course, Hennessy and ginger ale, Hennessy, fin de cognac and ginger ale can be really, really well received. But also in a cocktail, if you're looking for more delicate cocktails, it works. You want something with bold flavors, try Hennessy VS. You want something with more subtle, delicate approach, try Hennessy fin de cognac. And you'll see that both of them can have a different... Uh, can be perceived differently. We had a program called Hennessy and Tea, which worked really, really well. And we try uh, Hennessy Fin de Cognac with, um, with green tea or black tea with sugar and uh, some type of preserve as well all together. It works really, really well. That fruity slash very floral aspect definitely worked well. Those are the two products that uh, we wanted to, to, to present because we do believe that those Hennessy Fin de Cognac and Hennessy VS are really, really good bases to reveal a good cognac aromas. And this is a very, we're trying to get a more modern way to get cognac to be enjoyed. You're thinking, of course, um, cognac is, it's, it's pretty modern to uh, do something like that. Well, little... Uh, Remain, remind, reminder of, uh, you know, cognac. Cognac, you know, in a cocktail, when you know what cocktails are, cocktails were used, well, first used the word cocktail in 1806 uh, in the American magazine called The Balance. And at one point, cognac was the first and the most widely exported spirit. And uh, before it became an appellation d'origine contrôlée again, um, its origin already was a quality standard. It was exported pretty much everywhere. It was exported in Europe and the USA, you know, in the, in the, in the 18th century. It was exported in 1818 to Russia, to, uh, to China in 1859, uh, India and Cuba in 1860, and Japan in 68, and Australia in 1874. The 19th century saw a lot of cognac all over the place. What did that, well, um, well, um, what did that mean eventually? That meant that the cognac was also mainly the spirit of choice for the discerning gentleman. It was some type of upscale drink already. And you're thinking, well, this is going to be uh, pretty good to have uh, fancy drinks, you know, like that in the U.S. It appeared in uh, Jared Thomas's Bartender's Guide, you know, a book you might have heard about, obviously. Um, and this book featured heavily 
cognac and brandy drinks. And you know, some of them you might have heard about, Sazerac and the Brandy Crosta, they use cognac. The, the recipe might be a little different from what you originally, uh, what would you think about on a regular basis, but roughly, those cognacs, those uh, cocktails, used cognac 160 years ago. And people think now, well, cognac in a cocktail, are you crazy? Cognac is used to be, in, meant to be enjoyed, you know, in a big snifter by the fire with a big book and a wet dog in the middle of winter, and that's it. And this is a very traditional way. Well, let me tell you about tradition. This is a early 19th century, uh, early 20th century, late 19th century tradition, maybe. But the original tradition is to have fun. One of the values of Hennessy is hedonism, pleasure. People realize that just a snifter and a boring old book and a boring old dog there by the fireplace is not that much fun to everybody. Some people might enjoy more, a little cocktail, a little uh, nightlife and everything. So the Sazerac and the Brandy Crusta might be a good option for you. And then at the end of the 19th century, we had a little crisis called the Phylloxera crisis, a little tiny bug that uh, helped get, uh, you know, kill the vineyards pretty much. And the vineyards went from uh, 280,000 hectares to 40,000 hectares in about 20 years, less than that. That's a little, uh, a little uh, rough. So it, me it, meant, it means that we have, we had, some problems supplying all that. We had an enormous impact on the availability of cognac and people who used to like their cocktails, they stopped drinking it because from 280,000 down to 40,000, you don't have enough to be able to, produce, to, to supply the whole world. So pretty much what the cognac producers were thinking said, we're not gonna be selling those stuff, we're holding back on the inventory. So eventually, cognac had a little problem being distributed and the 20th century was um, uh, something somehow more difficult because of that phylloxera crisis. Eventually, mentality has evolved. Cognac was not so popular because they had less and less and less, and cognac was replaced. Mint julep, bourbon, Sazerac with rye whiskey, sidecar, you know, they've actually put tequila inside, made a margarita out of it. Okay, well, mint julep, beginning to start, I mean, starting to be the mojito. So uh, those things uh, eventually, you know, worked better. And uh, cognac has been uh, having a hard time coming back. But the basics were not forgotten. And in the 30s, we're starting to see things like Hennessy sidecars, you know, all over. Even uh, friends from Clico up there. Uh, we don't forget the, you know, the guys in the family. Um, but Hennessy, me and Julep, we started to go back and said, hey, people, don't forget about the classics. In the 30s, it went like that. In the 60s as well, it went like that. We, we started to promote a little bit more cognac in cocktails. But after the 60s and after the, actually after the 40s, the American consumption and whiskey and all that started to, you know, plant a seed in our mind. And uh, we kind of forgot about this thing. 90s, 1990s, and the 2000 revival of the classics. What do we mean? Hennessy Sazerac. This is a beautiful. That can be sampled, if I'm not mistaken, down there at the Hennessy booth. So please feel free to stop by for a little uh, sampling of Hennessy Sazerac. Hennessy Brandy Cresta, same one. Beautiful drink, beautiful drink. Nicely balanced and uh, much better than margarita. Sorry for the tequila friends. Uh, Hennessy Eggnog, great for winter. Beautiful uh, Christmas drink. Cream and simple syrup and everything. Ooh Hennessy Citrus. We had also a little review of um, all the different, uh, you know, some, uh, some more modern, very, very Hennessy personalized versions. We had Hennessy Citrus, Hennessy Apple, Hennessy Berry, and Hennessy Ginger type of cocktails developed and all that. Hennessy Citrus being one of them. It's our version of the classic sour. Hennessy ginger, as I just mentioned, you know, a little bit spicy notes, you know, Hennessy VS, bring that spice to it. Beautiful little drink, give it a try down there at the Hennessy booth. Uh, Hennessy autumn, the fall version, same thing with fin de cognac, something lighter, more elegant, a little bit more delicate. So we're trying to get Hennessy fin de cognac with ice green tea, more floral, with a uh, little you know, apple liqueur and things like that. It's a beautiful little drink for fall for, with a beautiful cold weather that we are experiencing now. 
it's uh, everything we need. Um, feel free to sample those nice, beautiful cocktails down there at the booth again, and I will be more than uh, welcome, to, more than happy to uh, share a glass with you. One thing I wanted to say also, we're involved, Hennessy is involved in the bartending community, the mixologist community in general, and we like to promote certain tools. One of them is an app, an application, um, which actually, ooh, that is, in, I'm, I'm, don't even bother reading this. If you can understand whatever is written up there, you're smart, and I'm not. I'm not a big technology guy. My, my major is grape growing and winemaking, so... Uh, uh, I don't know what that is, but roughly I think, I think it is an app that works like Facebook type of thing. It's all a community. You get there, you share your ideas, you share your recipes, you share your passion, you share your knowledge about cocktails, cognac, cognac cocktails all together. This will be available pretty soon and, um, and uh, make sure you, uh, you, I mean, you, you can go online, go to Facebook and look all the information that you have over there and uh, trust me, this is something that uh, will help everybody you know, getting some right information and sharing. We're in a world of, we're, where communities share, we need to share all that all together. Uh, so it's going to be available in 2012 where App Store and Android Market. We don't have that in vineyards. No, 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 no. Anyway, um, there it is. Just so you see what we can do with Hennessy, not only here, but in other places of the world, let me finish with this little, uh, this little uh, you know, video that shows pretty much what we can do in other places of the world. I hope we have sound. Thank you so much for your attention. If you have any question, now's the moment. Go ahead. You can keep that. You keep that. I keep we'll that. do the Q&A now. Tak, dámy a pánové. Dámy a pánové, děkuji Fabianovi. Tak, teď je zase ta přežitost pro vás, jestli byste měli nějaké otázky. Nějaká otázka? Ruce nahoru, hostesky k vám přenesou mikrofon. Jakákoliv otázka? Tamhle kolega v tom růžovém svetru. Dobrý den, mě by zajímalo, proč Fende Koňák má nyní takovou barvu, jako ve finále má. A protože mě přišel, že dejme tomu třeba dva, tři roky na zpátek, ta barva byla trošičku jináčí. Yes, well, Fin de Cognac um, was first launched in 2002 because the European markets did not care too much on a majority basis for Hennessy VSOP. So something lighter, more elegant, more delicate, more subtle was launched. And it worked, but still not enough. So a couple of years ago, uh, three years ago exactly, I think, it was replaced with a newer packaging that looked more elegant and a newer blend. Not everybody's happy with it. The majority of people are pretty happy with it because it's something very different from VS. It's something very more different from the previous bla uh, batch, previous blend of, uh, of Fin de Cognac. 
And, uh, and so far, for bartenders, for drinkers who wanted something extremely light, extremely elegant, in a fairly competitive price, po price point, uh, it works, it's been working well. I know there's always going to be some people complaining about, you know, the, oh, it's not the same as before, and it's not as, you know, it's different. Yes, it is different. This is, uh, you know, we dare to do things a little bit differently, but for the majority of people, uh, it, it seems to work so far. Does that answer your question? Jo? Tak má ještě někdo nějakou otázku? Tam mám vzadu. Ještě dvě otázky, tři možná. Uvidíme, jak to stihneme. Můžeme ochutnat ještě XO třeba? Ještě jednou? Může, mohli bychom ochutnat XO? 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 Já jsem to zpětl, já jsem to zpětl, já jsem to zpětl. XO je a koktejl by itself. It is a very much cocktail. It's rich, it's strong, it's big, it's bold, it's, it's got structure, it's got tannins and lots of fruits and candied fruits, and I'm drowning you now. <laughs> but uh, no, we're, unfortunately, XO, we don't recommend mixing it that much. Uh, with an ice cube, it's perfect, but in a cocktail, we don't uh, want to see that happening too much. Thank you, so cool. thanks. Uh, another question, gentlemen in the back. Já se chci zeptat na Hennessy Paradis Imperial, jestli by nám pan mohl prozradit, jak staré směsi jsou v tomto koněku. Děkuji. Oh yeah, Paradis Imperial. Uh, same thing. Paradis Imperial and apple juice is really good. <laughs> Thank you. It's better than EXO. Okay. No, uh, Paradis Imperial is a blend of. Um, Eau de Vies that were distilled between 30 and 130 years ago. And this is something very, very unique. And the Paradis Imperial, it, it's to us what we call a chouchou in French. It's our dear little thing because it's a tour de force. It is something that we've been creating you know, with great passion and it's really, really difficult to create. Simple reason. It's difficult to have that kind of elegance that kind of complexity, that kind of subtlety in very old eau de vies. I'm going to talk briefly about the competition and also brands in our portfolio. Try Richard Hensi, try Laure de Martel, try uh, Rémi Martin Louis XIII, Louis XIII, for example. You'll see they're all big, muscular, oaky, over-strong, over-heavy type of cognac. Try uh, Paradis Imperial, it's got major elegance, major subtlety, major finesse, all that with eau de vies that are very old. And trust me, you need two things to be able to create a product like that. You need very good inventory, and you need lots of skills and lots of talents. And eight members in the tasting committees are just enough to be able to create something like that. No other house can offer a product like this so far. Okay, thanks for the answer. Uh, last question. Tam have seen videos on the side, that someone else asked. I've seen it on the side. Vzadu, ne? Tak vepředu tady ještě mám jednu, jeden dotaz jsem viděl. Tady pán. Hello, I have a question. If some of your product... Si můžu poprosit česky, a aby všichni rozuměli. A samozřejmě. Chtěl bych se zeptat, jestli nějaký základní produkt od Hennessy, nebo to, co běžně můžeme sehnat, i Paradis Imperial a takhle, jestli obsahuje jako nějaký, který jsou ještě z doby před tou krizí, well, we have uh, eau de vies uh, in inventory that go back to 1800. The oldest eau de vie we still have in inventory is in Demijohn, under glass, no more evolution, no more aging, and uh, it was distilled in 1800. The phylloxera crisis roughly is 1872 to 1895, something like that. So uh, yes, we do have a large number of eau de vies that are pre-phylloxera. But it's not only phylloxera that is important. It's also the influence of the, I'll get you. It's the inf uh, how cognacs were distilled. Not only phylloxera, but how grapes were grown in 1850 or in 1830 or in 1820. How grapes were grown, how um, wine was made how distillation was taken care of, how maturation was taken care of. So it's a whole concept behind phylloxera. 
old eau de vies are very interesting that way, and we still have lots of amounts. That, I mean, the amount of old eau de vies that we have allow us to be able to recreate year after year, Richard NC, Paradis Imperial, NC Paradis, NC XO, and so on. Thank you, Dame and Panama. I'm Yiku Zapazornos, Fabian Lever. Thank you, guys.